Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives. I had Matt on the show about 60 episodes back, so please go back and check that one out. I believe it's episode 192. But here's the quick and dirty. My friend Drew told me that he found a great knife maker on Instagram that I should check out. Once I did, I discovered that Matt and Drew served together in the Marine Corps years back. Um, I also discovered that I am really drawn to Matt's work. Uh, I just fell in love with it, so much so that I asked him to build me the ultimate knife for my 50th birthday. Well, he obliged, and my folks picked up the tab, and today I am one of the happiest knife junkies out there. So on this episode, we're going to find out all about this build experience, because there was some drama involved. But first, a word to the wise. Like, comment, and subscribe. And if you can't finish this episode in video form, remember to download it to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen in on your way to work tomorrow or when you mow the lawn this coming Sunday, which you better do. And if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying interview extras, stickers, knife giveaways, early access to the show, and more, you can do so on Patreon. Now, the quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Matt, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to see you. Hey, Bob. Good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's my pleasure. So something I've been kicking myself about ever since our first interview, episode 192, was that I never asked you this very key question. So I'm going to start with this, which is what does hog tooth mean in your name, hog tooth knives? Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't, I keep we didn't cover that the last time. Um, so <laughs> no, I can't either. <laughs> when, uh, when you graduate scout snipe school, you're, you're awarded a hog tooth and it's a 308 round with a piece of parachute cord and you wear it around your neck. And, um, there's several different, um, legends or myths behind what, what they, what it means, but, uh, a lot of stories behind it, but, um, I put me on the spot trying to remember all the details of all this stuff. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's what you get when you when you graduate uh, sniper school and you become a hog, a hunter of gunmen. Before you graduate, you're a pig, a professionally instructed gunman. And then once you graduate, you're a hog. So uh, I always wanted to go towards that, you know, the military and the, the sniper community. So that's why uh, I chose a hog tooth name after that's. Uh, Good. That's a cool name. And I think that's how Drew linked up with you because, you know, he he was a former scout sniper. You guys ended up knowing each other and he was just trolling around, uh, trolling around Instagram and saw your name. But I, I, I assumed or presumed that it was an actual hog tooth and you put it on a cord, but, but it's the 308 bullet that represents the hog tooth. Right. Yeah. The, uh, way back. Um, oh, I can't, I totally space it out, but I, it used to, it used to be an actual hog tooth. Uh, okay. I can't remember who it was who actually did that. But, um, yeah, they would actually wear a hog tooth, but uh, now it's a it's a three eight round. That's pretty cool. Well, that's so that that puts you in a in a um, uh, I don't know kind of a sacred group there, and uh, that's a bond with other folks who have that hog tooth. Yeah. That yeah, yeah, it says a lot. Very small group, and uh, yeah. Um, small, very tight community. So, uh, tell the audience, maybe they haven't listened to one, one ninety two, and I urge them to go back and do so, but, uh, just in case no one knows, just give us the, give us the lowdown on how you got into, uh, building these, these beautiful knives you make. Uh, so I got started when I was a kid, um, 
Jimmy Fikes was a friend of my dad. A lot of people, uh, uh, Jimmy Fikes passed away a few, a couple months ago now, but, uh, so I, he made a knife for my father, uh, for my brother and I, and my father, after my father helped him build a new shop at one point, this is back in the mid eighties. And, um, I was enamored with the knives he made us and, uh, it was just, I was just hooked and I started trying to do it on my own. I had the uh, popular mechanics encyclopedia set at the time. That was awesome. Had all kinds of cool ways for kids to get in trouble. <laughs> so um, yeah, I started doing it on my own, you know, obviously doing a terrible job and I would start going to Jimmy's house and uh, work with Jimmy and Don Fogg and you know, all the other characters that Jimmy would have working at his shop occasionally. And, uh, I've been doing it ever since. Worked with Jim Cole up at the New England School of Metalwork a couple of years ago. Um, and anybody I can learn from along the way. Uh, so I've been doing it since the mid 80s, late 80s, I think. Wow. Uh, so you you are a bladesmith, meaning you forge forge your knives. Right. Yeah, I, I do I do some stock removal on some stuff. Uh, I do quite a bit of um, stainless steel stuff for some of my military knives. And, um, but I, I truly like forging the most. That's, that's where, uh, where my history is. And that's what I like, you know, I enjoy the most. Yeah. And you can see it in the, in the knife you made for me. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll reveal that in a second. People have seen it because I've been talking about it a lot on the show, but yeah, I, I will be releasing my close up video of this the day before this show goes live. So people, it'll be fresh in their minds. I'm going to show it off here too, but yeah. um, so, so it seems like forging and, and, and that way of building a knife is, is your, uh, your kind of truest uh, form of expression if you're going to express yourself through knives. But tell us about, uh, I know you do have some limited uh, limited offerings in terms of the stock removal stuff, uh, the military knives, maybe knives you only make for Marines and that kind of thing. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. Actually, I've got one of them right here. I've got, um, so this, uh, this knife, uh, the honor graduate high shooter and high stalker for uh, Scout Sniper School. Um, they get one of these knives. Um, I'm trying to get centered here. Mm. Um, there it is. Uh, so this is on the east coast. I'm, I'm trying to get it centered there. There you go. Um, the east coast schoolhouses, and I'm going to try to work on getting to the west coast schoolhouses. But um, so yeah, that's the knife they get. Um, so that's 154 cm and um, brown canvas micarta handles. Um, so yeah, I, I do, I do those specifically for those guys. Uh, that's, I modeled after a knife I made for myself before a couple of, uh, before deployment one time and then, uh, linked up with the schoolhouses and I've been doing that ever since. Wait, wait, what do you, you're saying schoolhouses, what does that mean? Oh, sorry. The, the scout sniper schoolhouse where the, where they go to school and train. Oh, okay. I got you. Okay. I guess I could have. I could have assumed that. I just haven't heard the word schoolhouse used with sniper. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so uh, yeah, I love the look of that knife. You showed that one off last time. And, and uh, I remember thinking maybe, uh, maybe I could ask my, uh, ask Matt for one of those. And, uh, and you were very clear that this is not a knife, you know, beautiful and functional as it is. This is not a knife for far and wide distribution. This is a special thing. Yeah, right. I, I, that one I make exclusively for for the honor graduates of, of, the, of the basic scout sniper school. So the, that's uh, just the top tier of that school. It's not even everyone who graduates. It's just the yeah. No, I'd love to give one to all of them that graduate. But no, it's just the the high shooter who shoots the highest on the right on the rifle. You know, on the uh, marksmanship uh, phase, and then the high stalker, which is the highest. Um, stalking through the you know stalking through vegetation through grass through whatever stalking up on a target um that's stalking basically that's a whole another rabbit hole we could go down but uh that's one of the toughest parts of the school is actually stalking so um the high stalker gets a knife and then the actual on graduate gets a knife which is the highest of all cumulative scores <laughs> Uh, okay, so, so I'm not a hunter, nor am I a sniper, but when you're talking about stalking, you're talking literally 
stalking a target like a, like a an animal stalks prey, like a predator stalks prey, getting as close as you can without being detected. Yeah, uh, yeah. This specific, um, it's probably changed since I went through school, but you had to get within a hundred yards of observers who are looking for you, act, and they have active walkers out there looking for you and stuff. Uh, so it's very difficult. A lot of guys get recycled or dropped for uh, for stock phase. So um, that's why the high stalker is a big deal. So right, right. So they get rewarded with their own hog tooth knife. How cool right. is that? <laughs> well, I, I guess that's a, <laughs> they go through a lot to get that damn thing. So yeah. I guess that's worth it. Yeah. All right. So so I want to I want to show off. Well, you know what? First, before I show off the knife you made. I will show you the knife I took measurements from to send to you. And it's uh, okay. So for those who don't know, I have a, an absolute lifelong love affair with the loveless sub hilt uh, fighter. Um, that's a double edged, very slender clip point blade with a handle that has a, 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 a sub hilt, which looks like a trigger. And the only one I have before the one you made me was this one from cold steel this is the oss and it's got double-edged oss8 oh, yeah. and you know it and it's got rubber and you can like the handle is rubber and it's pretty rigid but you can move all these parts around i always loved this style of knife and for a long time this is the only one i could get my hands on because not you know production companies generally don't make these and then you know and then if you want to get a custom, you're moving into top dollar. And yeah. I just never, I just never had that bandwidth, but I always wanted one. So I got this years and years ago at this point, this lives on top of my, my fridge in case someone jumps me while I'm pouring myself a glass of juice or something. <laughs> um, but I always liked the dimensions of this one, the length of the blade, which is what is this seven or eight inches. Um, I, I'm terrible at this one, but yeah, it's like eight inches and, uh, you know, so I I looked at this and took some measurements and then drew out something, a rough sketch and sent it to you um, after our last interview or yeah, after the last time we talked on episode 192, I was like, I got to get this guy to make me something. Um, what can I afford? And I drew out a couple of tiny little knives and then and then my folks were like, this is for your 50th birthday. We'll buy it for you. And I was like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I went all in. Um, you said a good sketch too, by the way. That was a really oh, good sketch. Oh, thank you. I, I've been I'll, drawing. Uh, oh, good. No, I was going to say, I've been drawing knives in the margins of what I should be working on all my life. What were right. you going to say? No, I was going to say, I've gotten some absolutely terrible sketches from customers before. They, they, <laughs> they're like, I want it to look like this. And I'm like, no, I'm not doing I'm, that. I'm quite it sure you like don't. A, if you could make a stick figure of a knife, that's what sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the knife here. I'm going to I'm going to move the cold steel out of the picture now and show the 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 knife that you ended up making me. And it is uh exquisite. I, I love this. This is my my uh, my prized knife. I have uh I have a few that that have serious sentimental value and this is one of them. Um and I just want to show this off real quick. People, people may have seen this in the close-up video, but this is a pattern weld steel, a Damascus steel, and and uh, we're going to talk about how you made that. We've got this gorgeous stag handle, and I happen to know that you got this stag at Blade Show 2021 when I was there. I, you know, we bumped into you, and and that's yeah. what you were shopping for, among other things. Great place to buy materials, right? Oh yeah, it's a great place to buy materials. Always. It's nice to be able to look at the stuff and just have it in your hand and see what's going to work for what your project is, you know. Um, so that yeah, that was that was awesome. I went through piles and piles of stag to find that stuff. Cause some stuff was was too wide, uh, uh, not not too wide, but not wide enough or wasn't long enough. So yeah, this this was something um, this was something you were telling me about, like finding the right piece of stag is a real challenge for any knife yeah. right right yeah especially if, if if you're ordering it you know you, you don't see what you're you, you get whatever they pick out of the box and send you so i like to you know be able to pick it up and make sure it's gonna fit the project so and 
yeah, like I said, I, I just went through tons of them. So, you know, some of, and those are scales. So, you know, it's, it's sliced in half and, you know, sometimes the, the right scale was too thin, you know, it was way thinner than the other one. So it was really, it was, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there was a, a short of, of uh, perfect scales there, but uh, I finally found them. A lot of times you can find the, the tapers, you know, the actual, um, the antlers not sliced up, you know, sliced up. Mm -hmm. um, but finding scales that are that wide is sometimes a challenge. So once once you got these, got the stag, you picked out the the pieces that you thought would work. You ran into an issue. What was what happened there? Uh, well, the first one um, was that the scale the the stag wasn't going to be big enough to do below the uh, sub hilt and in between the two, the sub hilt and the main guard. So where there's black. Right. So yeah. So I had to come up with an idea of something that would, um, you know, if I'd have thought, if I'd have thought of that ahead of time and while we were still at the way, I would have bought, you know, another piece that looked close, but I didn't have anything that looked even remotely close to that. So I thought the, the black, um, rich light would look good in there. Yeah. Which is, that was what that is. Um, so yeah, that, cause it, it was going to be close to length. But then it was very narrow at that point, you know, where I would have sliced those pieces of those uh, scales out to put in where that bit black bridge light is. It would have been too mm -hmm. narrow. It would, it just would have, the symmetry would have been off. So you mean it wouldn't have fit from right. dorsal from to pectoral? Right. Okay. So that's why I decided to do the, uh, the ridge light. But then you, um, you, you fell into not fell into, but you dis you ran into. So this is the first time you've made a sub hilt folder, right? I mean, not folder, sub yeah. hilt uh, knife uh, fighter at all, right? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, initially, so. from the drawing I sent you, it looked like I just had a, a full a whole piece of stag on a, a rat tail tang or something, right? Right. Oh yeah, yeah. That's another. That was another issue too. Um, yeah. So. I'm trying to remember the details of why I did what I did, but uh, yeah, you had uh, like the crown, which is where the antler meets the you know the base of the antler meets the uh, the skull of the of uh, the deer or whatever it is. Um, and that's what you had on there, and I just I thought it would look better as a full tang rather than um with you know and with the sub hill i thought it would look better and look more like the picture you, you drew um with scales so i ended up going with the frame construction which is what that is so the the frame the browned piece that looks like a full tang that goes mm -hmm. around that's that's a separate piece of 1095 oh this right here right so and essentially Un underneath here, underneath the handle, you've got uh, if this if this is the handle, you have you actually have a metal uh, frame exactly underneath it like this, right? R right. And, and then the, the tang of the blade seats in here, right? And the blade is pinned through through the stag scales, and then those other silver pins are connecting it to, you know, through the, through the frame to the tent. Okay. All right. So, so these, these silver pins, which we'll get to in a minute, because you got, yeah. you sourced those, uh, you, you sourced a lot of interesting material. You sourced the materials here in a lot of interesting ways, but basically right. these pins all along the periphery of the handle are going mm -hmm. into this frame that you put on the bottom of these scales. Right. Right. So, uh, all right, so that that was a that was a way to solve a problem, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, no, okay. good. No, good. Well, you 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 know you were not expecting this problem to arise, and it did. So how how much of how much of knife making in general is this kind of on the fly problem solving? Oh, all the time, all the time, especially if you get you know somebody orders something specific. That you don't normally make. 
how to make it so one, it looks good, it, everything flows and, and symmetrical, and two, it also is going to be functional and durable and um, and not look like a, you know a three year old made it. Hopefully, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> So then in, in getting, in dealing with the stag itself, I remember you telling me you had to fashion or buy some tools to make that work. What, what was that? And why did you have to get new tools for that? So what I ended up getting, sorry, I'm going to get my battery from my phone because I didn't expect to be doing it on my phone. Um, so if you can imagine trying to, trying to drill the holes through the stag, through the frame, and then the other side of the of the stag, trying to get all of those holes all matched up so they go straight through was a challenge. And because often it's not a problem when you're starting with flat stock, you know, flat micarta or flat wood or whatever the material is usually, I would, you know, make sure it was all flat and I could drill a straight hole through something flat, no problem. Mm -hmm. But the, the surface of the, um, of the stag being so irregular, um, that posed a, a new challenge for me. So I ended up, uh, buying a, a jig from, uh, John Perry that, um, holds the, scales of the material and the frame or if it's if it was on you know it would hold your blade too if it was a full tang knife but i just mm -hmm. use it to hold the frame i wish i had it here in front of me but it's in the shop um it holds the material on the bottom and then the frame on the top and then it pushes it up against the jig itself so you can use Oh, so hard to explain, but so you can have the material flat against your frame or your tang, and then you can drill down through the holes, and then you can reverse it and do the other side, and it's, it keeps everything um, keeps the holes nice and straight. So then it just everything lines right up. So the real issue is is getting the holes not only lined up but straight all the way through all three materials. So right. you can put one pin through. Okay, in in my um, very, uh, limited, uh, noodling around here, making, making my version of what a knife is. Uh, I always found that the most difficult part and the part that see, it, it seems like it should be the most straightforward is drilling the holes through the handle materials, through the full tang. That's all I've ever done. And through the other side, through right. that other scale, it seems like that should make, you it know, if the drill easy, goes right? through it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If the drill goes yeah. through it, you should just and 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 if it's all measured correctly, that pin should just slip right in, and it never, that's it. But it's it's never like that, or at least it no, hasn't been the twenty times I've attempted. Yeah, it's um, it can be difficult. You you drill, but it can end up at even just the slightest angle, even if you're doing it on a drill mm -hmm. press. If you're you know if if everything's not level and flat, um, so that was um that jig was a huge help and um. That so that it's basically two uh, two C's basically that ride on two uh, two bars so you can adjust the, them in and out and so they're you know, they they sit like uh, oh they sort of pinch it yeah they, so the, yeah there's adjuster screws that come up through the bottom and everything sits up flat and you drill, drill through the top so I had already drilled the holes in the frame and then clamped it in there with the stag on the bottom and then drilled through the frame of the stag and then flipped it over and did it with the other side of the of the stag so <laughs> i remember a couple of the phone calls we had back and forth yeah, yeah. and uh there was one phone call i missed and then i real i saw a couple of days later this isn't uh you know an unusual thing for me and i'm like oh geez i gotta call matt and you're like yeah Hey, what's up? I solved the problem. <laughs> I was <laughs> yeah. like, what was that? You found that jig. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh I can't remember what I called you about it in particular about it, but it was about whether uh I think it was whether you were absolutely married to the idea of stag on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be honest. I'm, I'm glad like, I didn't pick I, up that call. <laughs> yeah, me too. 
Because <laughs> I was like, how the hell am I going to drill drill through this stag? And if you show the handle, I mean, you can see that there's a flat spot on it. No, no, you not know. a flat spot on it. By the way, you picked an absolutely gorgeous piece of stag here. I mean, this is... Yeah, that's actually, I think piece. this is the only stag I have, period, in my collection. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think. Uh, I know not on any fixed blades, and yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of all my my slip joints. And I have stagalon, which is plastic. I don't think that right. counts. <laughs> no, that doesn't count. <laughs> no. Uh, and, that, and now, just looking at this, I'm I. One thing that I really love on knives, you see this a lot on coffin handled bowies a lot or buoys depending on where you live but that's yeah. that's the uh, multiple pins sorry I'll let, let this focus up but the multiple pins that go around you know the the handle you see that a lot on the coffin uh, yeah. shaped handles and um, but on this one it's necessary um but I love the way it looks tell me about those pins so those <laughs> that's another that's another thing so I made a, I had to make a, a pin doming jig cuz that was the first that I'd uh, done the domed pins like that. Um, so I'll give a, a shout out to Nick Wheeler and his, uh, his YouTube videos on, uh, he has a great pin doming video. Um, so I made the, the uh, setup to do that. Uh, but then I was going to do them originally with stainless steel. And then I realized I was going to, I was going to split the, the stag if I spent that much time peening pins over because the stainless steel was a little, takes a little more filming, uh, you know, a little more, you, you're doing it with a, a small hammer and a punch. And I thought for sure I was going to break that stag. Okay. Let yeah. me, let me ask you, I'm sorry, before you continue. So you're talking about uh, if you had used stainless steel pins on the stag, are you saying that peening it, which is hitting it with a hammer and rounding it up? Right. Are you saying that doing too much of that on the stag because the stainless steel is so hard? That you yeah, would have to just, do a lot of that, and it would affect the stag. Yeah, I don't know if it would have. So that's, I was, that's what I was worried about. I didn't want to come across it as a problem because um, it's it's in a couple spots that stag's kind of thin. Um, so rather than address that problem, if it became a problem, I went. I decided to go with the the silver pins, uh, which I think look great anyway. Um, and then, uh, I got the silver from, uh, Chris Pluff, uh, Chris Pluff designs and, um, that's eighth inch silver. And, uh, so that's actual silver. Yeah. yeah. And the guy you yeah. got this from, he's a jeweler, jewelry maker or something. Yeah. And he does, uh, he does a lot of Damascus for Damascus jewelry and he does some really cool stuff. It's Chris Pluff designs. And he's, he's local here to me. So I went Check out a shop when I picked up the silver. It's pretty awesome. So what did what did he think about what you were buying that silver for? Oh, he thought it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I brought the knife and showed him and it was oh, cool. It was in a million pieces. Like I think there's 26 pieces in that handle, counting all the pins. <laughs> that's that's cool. Because <laughs> there's a lot it of just pins. Just means you there. yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, pins underneath the surface. Yeah. So, well, there's there's a pin in a pin through. There's two pins through that bake light. Oh, and, uh, yeah, yeah. Look, look at me. I'm pointing at the phone like you can see me. <laughs> so, so there's yeah, there's pins in there. There's pins. There's two pins in the sub hilt that go through. Oh, oh yeah. I, you know what? I've never noticed these. I, I see yeah. them on this side. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also locator pins. I'm still pointing at the phone like an idiot. Um, so there's locator pins that go lengthwise, like if you go from the you know from the pommel through the tip that direction. Oh, okay. So they they go that way. They the locator pins go through the frame into the uh, sub hilt, and then through the sub hilt into the bake light, and then through the bake light into the main guard. I see what you mean. So kind of in this direction. Right. Right. Okay. And the locator pins are there to match all the pieces up so that they made up correctly without being all cattywampus. Yeah, exactly. So I can take everything apart, put it back together, take it apart, 
if I had to sand something, you know, to adjust something or, you know, file it or grind it or anything. So I could take it all apart and put it back together before the final assembly and glue up and, and doming the pins and everything. So, yeah. And that sub hill actually is also, I forgot about that. The sub hill is, the frame is machined, you know, and milled out a slot. So that sub hill is also locked in there. Um, you know, I, I milled out a, a slot through the frame itself at the bottom of where the, the trigger part, like you said, the of the mm -hmm. sub hill. So that not only is it pinned, but it's also there's a notch in there that that sub hill goes into so that there's multiple um, multiple points of where it's locked in to see, you know, the pins and the, the pins, the epoxy, the, um, the, uh, and that notch. But the, for lock so, so you, you have pins going oh. kind of perpendicular, uh, coming in this way from the handle locator pins going this way, you have right. epoxy in there. So how, how rigid is that? I mean, to me, I hear 26, you know, to, uh, 20 pieces to the handle. Wow. That's a lot of people, but it seems like all together, the way they're constructed, it's a network. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, definitely, it's, uh, you know, you've got, um, uh, good brain fart words, but you've got actual mechanical fasteners and, and then you've got the epoxy in there and then, um, you know, all the pins are peened over. And, uh, so it's pretty, pretty solid. As solid as I know how to make it. Yeah. Well, as I told you, uh, if I ever get called out in a duel, this is the knife yeah. I bring. <laughs> Hopefully it's a knife duel. <laughs> I'm I not showing up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So I want to move up the handle, uh, to the, to the, um, beautiful cross guard and sub hilt you put on oh, here. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hold this up close to the camera because I want, I want viewers to see the, you know, it looks great from this angle, but as you turn it, you see all of the chamfering and, and the shaping of that. Uh, you know, they both have these expanded lobes that come out that just aid in retention and aid in looking cool. Tell me about the, uh, this material and the cross guard and you know what what your impressions of building this kind of knife are because this is this is what makes this knife this knife this and the long slender double-edged clip point uh which we'll get to yeah. in a minute but tell me about these uh the hilt and the cross guard so those are uh they're both wrought iron that i got um they both came out of the longfellow bridge in boston which is longfellow the yeah it's uh if you, if you see a picture of boston it's the salt and pepper shaker bridge they call it but um i don't remember when it was originally made but a friend of mine uh is an iron worker he's also a blacksmith and he uh he get they were rebuilding the bridge and they were just throwing away all this wrought iron and his foreman's like if you want it take it we're you know we got to pay to scrap it so um he got me a few bars of that so I forged those uh, roughly to, you know, not, not, not to shape, but I forged them to the thickness and widths I needed. And then, um, you know, with the machine, the slots and, um, and uh, did file work and grinding and hand sanding to get them the shape that they needed to be. And then uh, they're both, actually, there's also a, there's a little um, a ferrule underneath the guard there. This right that, here? Yeah, that's out of the same wrought iron. What's the ferrule for? That that helps with the, the making the um, lining up the pins and everything. Um, oh, okay. That way, because I can that way I I drill the holes for the locator pins in the guard. Well, first I did them in the in the handle in that little ferrule, and then I can just glue the feral to the guard so it's all a matter of helping to keep all the holes lined up um and go ahead well, i was just gonna say looking at the guard and the sub hilt from this aspect and i i really really love this sort of a spade type mm. shape or i don't know what to call that shape but 
Um, this is a flourish of your own. I mean, this whole knife is a flourish of your own. I just sent you a sketch, but the sketch I sent you was very basic from, and, and just from this aspect, how did you, like, where did this come from? I, I, I'm so, I'm so happy that these are shaped like this, but I never oh, awesome. thought to, yeah, I never thought of that. Um, and you know, like I haven't thought of a lot of th considerations that went into making this, but that in yeah. particular is one of those things. It's a like nice little flourish that just gives it some extra. So how did you come up with that? What's, what was your inspiration besides the drawing? You know, I don't even know if I really had an inspiration as so much as I just, uh, I originally drew an oval on it just to get a rough, you know, make sure everything was centered on the you know, the, of the, the top edge and the bottom edge. And then, um, I just started, honestly, just started going with the grinder and started, I saw a look, I'm like, Oh, I kind of like that. And then just, it developed into those, uh, just with the small wheels on the grinder. Um, I did one side and I was like, Oh I, yeah, that that's it. And then I made it, you know, transferred it to the other side. Um, but yeah, I wish I could had some sort of, uh, fancy inspirational story but I just, <laughs> just kind of let it do what it was doing on the grinder well it's it's one of those details that to me make this uh, make this even more uh special it's because it's yeah. cool like as you turn it in space and and by the way that's like very much like uh you know what it's like to paint or draw or write you know you 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 start working on something and it starts to dictate to you where yeah. it needs to go yeah, exactly. Do you find do you find that happens a lot in knife making? Oh, I mean, yeah. besides oh, when you're right. making this exquisite thing? Yeah. It, it, I don't often have, you know, I'll I'll draw a close sketch to what I think I want to make, but mostly I'll just kind of just have a rough idea of what I want to make and then just go from there. Um, unless I'm doing something specific like yours. Um I like to let, let it go and see what what's uh what looks cool to me at the time, you know. Do the materials determine, you know, while you're working on a knife, say it's not this knife and, you know, I wanted something specific, but say you're just working on something for yourself or someone gives you uh, an order that is a lot more open-ended as to, you know, what the final product looks like. Uh, do you find that the materials that you decide to uh, use end up dictating the look and the shape and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, it definitely will if I, if I have my, or if the customer or if my, I myself have my mind set on using a certain piece of material, um, you know, whether it be antler or, you know, whatever, uh, the width of it has some, you know, has, has a say in how wide the ricasso of the blade is. And, um, you know, same with any of the other materials have a little bit of, a little bit of say in what I'm doing as far as uh, um, trying to keep everything symmetrical and pleasing to the eye and functional, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to, I want to talk about this blade for a second here. Yeah. Um, I mean, star of the show. Uh, well, I don't know. It's hard to say with that handle and all, all of its <laughs> pieces, but, but uh, as you were um, making this knife, something I really appreciated. And, you know, I have a, a a few custom knives, nothing nearly as custom as this. Yeah. Uh, it's more like I have, uh, you know, someone offers a model and I say, yeah, I want that one. And it's of a small batch or it's, yeah, I want that one. It's already cut out. I'd like this handle that handle, you know, custom to that yeah, extent, yeah. nothing like this. Um, one thing I really appreciated was that you kept sending me pictures of how things were progressing. And, uh, what I found very interesting were the pictures of making the steel. Um, tell me about what the, what the two steels are in this uh, pattern weld um, steel and what the process was to get that very unique. I don't think I've ever seen this kind of diamond shape uh, pattern before with this, with the sort of organic swirls in the middle. It's like sort of yeah. geometric, sort of organic. How, how the hell did you get that? Uh, together oh, that, that could be its own podcast that was, <laughs> um so that's a it's a mosaic whereas i took um i'm trying to remember how many 
I started with a, a billet of Damascus. I made uh, 27 layers. It was 15 and 20 and 1095. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so forge welded that, stretched it out and flattened it out. And then I put, um, I think it's four layers of thicker 1095 in between. That's those dark layers you see in the diamonds. That's the, so the, the okay. light colored steel is the 15 and 20. Okay. And uh, then the darker ones, that's the 1095. Um, so forge that all out. Uh, so here I, I took the original billet and then restacked it and put the four layers of the 1095 in the middle in between each, mm. each piece. And then forge welded that drew it out into a big square bar and then um oh, i'm trying to remember the whole process of what they did with that one um so oh and then i forged it at a 45 so it was a square bar and then i forged it on a 45 and then so that's why all the lines are going and at this point all you can see the pattern on the pattern I'm trying to develop is actually on the end of the bar. It's not in the middle of the bar. Okay. Um, so then I cut that into four, you know, those, while it's still square. And then those, then I etched, I etched the ends of it. So I knew which way those dark lines were going mm -hmm. and then lined up the bars so that they made that diamond shape. Okay, so this was the this was the point where you cut. Um, uh, what I remember from the pictures uh, was that you you had a bar and then you cut it, and then you right, then placed I, placed them next to each other or something. Yeah, so it was a still a square bar, and then I cut it at forty degree angle, making basically kind of a trapezoid, um, mm -hmm. so that those tiles could I would lay those tiles flat, and then the, the next tile overlapped it. And then the next one overlapped that. Um, so then I so I laid all the tiles out on a sacrificial sacrificial piece of real thin sheet metal. And then so then basically made a sandwich out of that. So those tiles are laid down, overlapping each other, tack welded to that sheet metal, and then put another piece of sheet metal on the top, welded the whole thing up, and then forge welded it again. So that all those tiles are for, now forge welded together. And the purpose of cutting those at a 40 degree angle is now for one, they line up with each other and they overlap each other, but also now you're seeing in the cuts, you're seeing the end uh, on the, the end of the bar. What you see on the end of the bar is now on the face of the blade, basically. Right. Which is that diamond shape, right? Right. <clears throat> and then and force welded it together grind off that sacrificial pieces of sheet metal on the surface grinder and then get it down to damascus you know and you know so you get through all that all the sheet metal so you can see the damascus and then uh i forged it a little further from that i forged the tip on it and then forged it a little wider and drew it out to the right thickness and stuff and then from there i did all grinding other than forging the tang and the tip and because with with the mosaic, you don't want to forge a lot of it. It'll it'll distort the pattern you're looking for. Ah, oh. so that's why you so see you, it all goes to the. You can see where I forge it to the tips so, because all the lines go to the tip. Right. You know it tapers. You know tapers into the tip. Yeah. And then uh, towards the tang end, you can see a little bit of it too. That's from hammering in this direction and hammering in that direction. That those right. That that the lines. Oh, that is so cool. Uh, so just from watching Forged in Fire, you know, that's my <laughs> that's my education in, yeah, in yeah. Damascus. And uh, I think it's cool. I, I love the idea of the use and the and the um, and the role of um, non hardening steel. What do you call it? Uh, uh, um, like mild steel. Yeah. Mild steel in 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 the process of making a nice damascus uh I, I i like the idea of like the canister damascus it's mild steel you put everything inside and uh you either coat the inside of it with white out and then and then peel that off or if you're on forged and fire and you're under a time constraint you just grind <laughs> that that crap off right 
Yeah, you could grind it off. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's a couple of different ways of doing that. Yeah, but yeah, I, with the sacrificial, like the piece I was talking about, I just grind it off until it's gone. That way, that I know that everything left in the blade is is good. You know, um, hardenable, good steel, either fifteen and twenty or ten ninety five. With that, in in this case, um, but yeah, yeah, they <laughs> the forge and fire the the uh, a lot of times. So you see him battling to get the can off. I would just, <laughs> I would just leave it on and grind off where the, you know, grind off part of it. You know, I, I, I kind of mention this all the time because, you know, my wife and I watch that show. And, yeah. uh, you know, uh, I've done a, an extremely limited amount of knife making around here, around around the basement and the, and the shed. Yeah. You know, and my wife has done absolutely zero. But even even she knows when we watch that, that show, she's like, why? Y- haven't you ever watched this show? Like, don't bother right. with the whiteout. Just grind off the mild steel. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah. yeah, when I when I saw that all lined up in that, I was like, ooh, I know what he's going to do there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so but... this this blade, well, like, ooh. okay, once you once you got it all uh, forged out, I mean, I'm looking at yeah. the grinds here, and the grinds are absolutely perfect. And I and I'm looking uh, from you know doing this. Whoosh, and looking at this center ridge line, and yeah, it's I, I, perfect. Tell me lot. about grinding this thing. I cursed you a lot when I was grinding that thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Well, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, I. So I did. The, I I ground out the you know I forged out the profile, then I gr- cleaned it up, grinding the pro, uh, the profile, you know, the perimeter of it, um, and then. Uh, um then i decided where i wanted the the plunge lines to be and those are uh you know i described the plunge lines on there where those where i roughly wanted those and then um scribe the center line on each side make sure it was right where uh you know same on both sides and also scribe center lines on the edge where the actual sharp sharpened Mm -hmm. edge will be um and then just start grinding slowly. <laughs> I, I first I grind to my um, center lines, you know, on the cutting edge on um, both the top and bottom cutting edge because both of them are sharp. Um, so I grind to that first, and then I slowly work my way up to that straight um, center line. Um, but yeah, that's just just a matter of. Um, going slow and um, not rushing it, you know, just just yeah. keeping my keeping my center lines true, and um, and then uh, the 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 plunge lines, those I polished up after um, after grinding. I polish those up with um, with stones, um, you know, polishing stones up inside there and then um I'm trying to think of if any other uh, problems with grinding that well uh, okay so while you're thinking of that i mean just looking at it what what is really impressive to me um and and what i can't quite figure out how you did and i'm not going to ask you this is just a skill you've acquired over 25 years of making knives i'm sure but this medial ridge uh that goes between the top edge which is they're both hollow ground uh, but right. this this top bevel is obviously shorter than the bottom bevel. Um, right. But this this medial ridge retains the flat of the ricasso about halfway up the blade, and then about halfway up the blade, it just uh, one grind meets the other in a in a in a like perfect peak. So you have this flat that continues to right about here where it it transitions into a peak, and and uh, to me that's very impressive. I'm not going to try and ask you to describe how you did that because you just did that from feel. I imagine that's experience yeah. right there that that accomplished that. Yeah, um, and just following your your scribe lines, you know, just and just practice and uh, yeah, I guess it's a lot of practice, it's a lot of screw. There's a pile of screwed up knives in my recycle. <laughs> uh, well, I, I feel. I feel like I kind of traumatized you by asking you to build this for me, 
but no, no, uh, I was excited to build it, but it, <laughs> and, and I didn't, I didn't realize the, the little, the little stuff, uh, the little, um, the little challenges I would come across by having it, uh, stag full tang, so you know, just, uh, everything added up to, uh, to, a, 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 I learned a ton on that night. So it was awesome. So is this is this a uh, something you would do again if someone said, "Oh, I saw Bob's subhilt folder." Uh, I keep saying folder. I saw I Bob's subhilt fighter. Um, can you make me one? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll definitely no, I'll definitely do more subhilt subhilt fighters, but um I don't think I would I'm not going to do a lot of them with stag. Uh that, I want that. That'll be a one-off. Yeah, you know, I was trying to jam as much of what I love into this yeah. knife, you know, and uh, I love stag, and and then it occurred to me, you know, what I could have done is had a micarta handle, and you're yeah. like, God, why didn't you? And uh, uh, that would have been boring. And then, I didn't like <laughs> micarta though, though. So I. It, it, you know, for your 50th, you got to do something. You got to church. No, of course. Of course. I'm, I'm perfectly, but, but my thought was then the sax and the Bowie, I asked him to make somewhere down the line because yeah, you're, yeah. I love your Bowies and you made a right. sax not too long ago. I don't think, uh, did you make a sax? Am, am I, am uh, I, no, I have not, I haven't made a sax. I don't well, I know you that. could, and I know yeah. you would. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> you know, that, there. that with the stag, with the yeah, yeah. crown on it would be super sweet. Yeah, that would be cool. I've got a. Uh, I just did a couple of little little Damascus hunters that are on my Instagram with uh, crowns on them. Uh, oh yeah, I, I saw those. Uh, I I have I've seen everything you yeah. put up and probably drooled over them. Um, I know that uh, I don't know if my. Jeez, uh, I hope I'm not spilling the beans, but I'm pretty sure my mom doesn't list. Oh yes, those yes, those were awesome. Yeah. Upper upper left. Um, but I, I happen to have it on good, uh, um, on, I, I happen to know someone who wants you to make a, um, kitchen knife for my mother. Uh, oh, okay. It's my dad. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at some point, I think he's going to be getting in touch with you. Uh, I don't know for so, one, one of their anniversaries, but he was so yeah. impressed, uh, is so impressed with your work. And, um, you know, they came up to visit, we had a big, uh, pig roast for, for my birthday and, uh, before most of the guests showed up, my dad's like, open it, open it. <laughs> and so I yeah. opened it and everyone's like, whoa. You know, everyone's like, oh, Bob's opening up a knife. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah, I was like, yeah. no, 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 no. And I opened it up and people were, uh, astounded. And these are non knife people. And then they were not only astounded by the knife, but like myself, they were astounded by this gorgeous leather sheath that you built for it. <laughs> and it's, and, 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 uh, I'll, I'll be totally straightforward with you. One thing that I love about it is this corset here. It's like, it's, <laughs> you know what I mean? It looks like a, it looks like yeah, a woman's does, corset it. on the front. And, yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I like that for what it evokes, but I mean, just looking over this sheath uh, you have, you seem to be equally talented in leather work as you are in, um, you know, making knives. This thing is, uh, you know, amazing. You could, you could farm out this ability to, you know, to <laughs> other knife makers. I know you don't have the, the desire, yeah, the right. bandwidth or the, you know, but, um, yeah, yeah. you know, you see a lot of, a lot of custom knife makers make knives and they don't include sheaths. And then you have to go right. about the process of finding, but I, I yeah. was so impressed by this sheath. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I do enjoy making sheaths. Um, but it's it's not um not my favorite thing to do, but it I do enjoy it, especially when they come out come out well. I like I you know it's uh it's fun to do. Um except like the sheath I was making this weekend and put the knife through the leather and <laughs> when it was almost done. <clears throat> so, yeah, that was a that's a fun one. You can't just patch that up and be like, oh, no, there's no, patch, no, there's no patch in that one. <laughs> <laughs> so this has so a full totally on uh, leather welt on the side. Yep. Yep. And, it's full and, leather welt. Um, oh man. Stitch so with, I stitch with uh, artificial sinew. Um, and then the, um, now I'm going to call it a corset on there. Cause I can't think of what the, uh, what another name for it would be. 
Um, but I got that design from uh, Mickey Wise. He was a knife maker when I was stationed in North Carolina. He he was kind enough to let me use a shop, and I learned a lot from him too. Uh, this was back in the '90s, um, and that he made that style sheath with a with a rifleman's knife. He called it. So I and I always liked how that because uh, that that corset part is a, is riveted to the belt loop. So it's all, if you were to undo those laces, that's all attached to the belt loop. Right. Um, so I always thought that was just kind of a cool, similar to a frog, but it's all, you know, it's all attached. Right, right. That's what I thought when I first saw this. I'm like, oh, it's a frog. So you can take it out and slide it under your belt. And I was like, oh, right. no, it, it's not. And, oh, man. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by this. Uh, Thanks. My brother does leather work and he does amazing stuff. His, his uh, like, like me, I think it's all the, all the men in my family. We seem to be inconsistent with our hobbies. We, we cycle in and out of them. And when he's in a leather cycle, I, I send him knives. Make me a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah, pretty right? good at it. <laughs> you got to catch him while he's in the cycle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, really impressed and so excited and, and happy about this knife. This is my, you know, my prized knife in my collection. I, like I mentioned before, I have, you know, uh, I have an Ontario rat too, that my daughter gave me that's prized. You know, I have, I have certain things that I prize because of what they meant or what they mean when they were given sure. to me, this embodies it all because I got to know you through that podcast, got to, got to know your work and like you as a person. And then my parents got involved and then, it, yeah. and then I saw you at Blade Show. It turned into this story and yeah. each, each element of this knife has a, a story to it. Like the, the, you know, making the Damascus, the bridge, uh, the Longfellow bridge wrought iron. I mean, you told me this right. bridge was originally made in 1890. So this is some old wrought so, yeah. iron. Yeah, it's it's real, it, which is hard to come by. You know, real wrought iron is uh, not hard to come by, but it's it's uh, there's it, I don't think there's I want to say there's one place making real wrought iron in the in the world. Uh, uh, I might be wrong about that, but I've I know I've been told some similar to that. Um, but yeah, so real wrought iron, it's just awesome to forge. Just really cool stuff. Uh, it's totally different than working with regular mild modern mild steel. So. It was really cool, and it takes a brown. That's a brown solution, like on the on the uh, wrought iron of you know, the guards. That's browned. So that's what they use. You know, like uh, traditional black powder rifles would have browned barrels um, mm -hmm. often, mm -hmm. oftentimes. So that's the same solution. You know, same type of thing. Just basically a um, basically a rapid rust. That's all it is. Okay. Uh, kind of kind of like a hard rust. Okay. Yeah. Well, when we were talking um, before you started making this knife and I mentioned, you mentioned the wrought iron in our yeah. first interview, uh, but you have an old, you had like an old plow or something that you were harvesting wrought iron from. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, um, the axle from the uh, old wagon axle that I had found out in the woods. Uh, so I, but then I got some of that, from the Longfellow Bridge, I thought that had an even cooler story because we knew where it came from. So. Right. All right. So as as we wrap up here, Matt, um, this this was a unique build for you, and um, you know, I had some complications that maybe you wouldn't want to repeat again. As you mentioned, you learned a lot on it, so if you had to repeat it, you might be able to oh, and yeah. all that. But 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 tell tell uh, listeners and viewers what what you really specialize in and what um, you know. The, the kind of knives you really love to make and that people come to you for over and over? Uh, well, I really, I really enjoy, um, you know, forge, forge knives, whether it be, I, I enjoyed making Damascus. I enjoy, uh, mono steel, uh, knives too, um, whether they're W2, 1095 or ADC RV2. Um, but I really enjoy forging the blades. Uh, uh I like Bowie's, um i do a lot of chef knives lately um i do and i i do enjoy doing doing a lot of the military stuff too so um i just like making knives 
Yeah. yeah. The diff the difference between a chef's knife and a knife you make a, for a marine that yeah. that has to be that has to be two different worlds. Am I yeah, right? That was a, that was that was a huge learning curve for me because the first time a chef actually made a knife, it was way too <laughs> it was way too thick and uh, definitely not not uh, what you would consider a chef knife. So yeah, I had to start make myself make them thinner, um, change the handles up a little bit. You know, just different things. It was definitely a big learning curve going getting into the chef knife thing. So. Uh, as far as a tactical knife, um, yeah, it was. I had to, I had to kind of pump the brakes and change things up a little bit. Figure it out. Yeah, yeah I would imagine it. It it's a um, a difference in geometry. Not only the cutting edge geometry, yeah. but the but the whole like the geometry of the handle to the blade, how much knuckle clearance, all that stuff that you don't right. necessarily think about with a field knife yeah the the heel um like, like you said the hand geometry the handle angles the the actual shape of the actual handle itself some people like a japanese style some people like a you know uh more western style um so yeah that was definitely um definitely uh a difference from going from tactical stuff to uh, to chef knives um, but i still like doing both so it's definitely expanded my skills doing both pointy and edgy things. Do you happen but, to have anything else around you? You could show off before we, uh, do you have your rifleman's knife, which I absolutely love. I don't have that here. That's okay. I think it's out in the shop. I well, people can go to episode one ninety two Cause you showed that off. Let's see what you got here. Uh, this is another, uh, more tactical one. Let me see. Mm. Oh, that's nice, man. There you go. How's that there? Is this model one that you offer to uh, the layman as well as uh, yeah. Marine? Yeah. Yep. That one's that one's uh, out there for whoever. And then uh, this one's a similar, uh, small. It was a little smaller. Oh, that's cool. I love the long clip on both of these. Yeah. So, um, let's get a little jimping in there. These are these are both 154 cm, um, both stainless. Um, trying to start having more of the um, you know, more stuff available, um, so I have knives at any given time if somebody is looking for something. But slowly getting better, getting better at having stuff in stock. Oh, I'm terrible! Yeah. Oh, don't even show my website. It's terrible. <laughs> well that's funny i mean like i gotta, I gotta work on that well what what you're saying right here is something um it, it's i think it's a perennial problem for custom knife makers it's like you know you want to have stuff available so that people who are interested in your work can just go on your site and buy them but at the yeah. same time you're working on custom orders and you're also yeah. i would imagine trying to you know experiment learn do stuff for yourself oh my gosh tomahawks i forgot you make tomahawks man <laughs> yeah oh right, you one of those next just take my money <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i'm such a sucker for it here right uh, i got one right there that's oh, oh yeah that thing that's an elmer <laughs> Rouge. nice whoops sorry let me go <laughs> no, <that's okay. laughs> um all right Feels well wrong so, with a good tomahawk no you cannot can you right. and uh and there's like uh there's the the hardcore kind of uh breaching tomahawks work i don't know the kind of tomahawks that you might want if you're on deployment that are full yeah. tang metal and then there are ones like this that you might want if you get in a in a bowie knife and tomahawk fight you know like right. there's there's a yeah. there's a whole world of tomahawks to explore so right <laughs> and I was talking to your good buddy Jonathan Caruso, who was on this show, and right. he's making tomahawks too. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You guys, yeah. You guys are gonna, you guys are gonna drain, drain my <laughs> my resources. Anyway, Matt, uh, it was a pleasure having you back on the show. I I I yeah. loved our, uh, uh, I loved hearing about um, the process of making this, the anguish, the pain that went into making this, makes it. You know, they say blood, sweat, and tears. There's blood, sweat, tears. 
and like yeah. uh, adrenaline and anguish and <laughs> anger and all sorts of stuff in this knife. Oh yeah. Oh, it's and all there. I love it. I oh, love this knife. I'm glad. I, uh, I was, I, I couldn't wait for your dad to give you the, give you the thing. Cause I was waiting. Cause he never, he never got back to me once. I, uh, I said that, you know, I kept tracking, you know, through the post office to make sure it got to him. And, uh, and I think he was out of town or something when it showed up. And yeah. I was like, just wait here. For one, it got it got there in one piece. And for two, that you liked it. So I was definitely on the, on the edge of the seat waiting for you to open it up on your birthday. That's funny. I was on my the edge of my seat because I knew my folks were out of town. They do a lot of traveling. And I was like, man, who knows? If this thing shows up and the mailman's like, oh, well, they're not here. I guess this box is mine. And some, some sucker is... <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna have my knife All right <laughs> anyway always... well thank you thank you matt man it was a it Thanks was a, a pleasure lot. oh no and... it's great i appreciate it it was it was, it was a fun build and uh, it's, it's always fun hanging out with you too now that we've met in person at blade show and stuff so that was yeah fun. All right, so I don't know. Give me a year to recoup, and then and then uh, I'll be I'll be ordering a, a sax with a with a full crown antler awesome. on it, and <laughs> that'll be Sounds the next good. labor of of hatred you have to work on for me. Oh uh, no, it's awesome. It'll be good. <laughs> That'd be a good build too. All right, Matt. Tell everyone right. how they can get in touch with you and find out how to buy a hog tooth knife for themselves. Um, best is either emailing me at hogtooth knives at uh, gmail dot com or Instagram is uh it's hogtooth knives also so um either of those two are the best way to get hold of me um a website where if you email me through on the website it'll come right to my email too so um yeah hit me up all right <laughs> sounds all good right. all right thank you sir thanks a lot all right talk to you all right. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. Probably worse. And you know what? I think I, I think I might be slightly worse. Uh, so here it is. I can't show it enough. I hope you uh, watched the close-up video I made of this knife and released yesterday. Um, uh, I, you know, I go into great detail. I have really nice lighting and you can see, uh, see and hear me just go off at the mouth about this thing. Um, so anyway, there he goes, Matt Chase. If you're interested in his brand of very cool Bowie knife and uh, tactical knife and chef knife, uh, look him up. And even if you're not in the market for a custom knife, go check him out, out at Hogtooth Knives on Instagram. All right. Well, make sure you check us out next week for another great interview. And uh, of course, it's Wednesday. Uh, check out Wednesday for our supplemental shows where I show you all the new knives that come across my desk, whether they're mine or someone else's. And then we dig deep into some important knife topic. And then, of course, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream where you can come on and you can talk with me and other people who come on using their phone with the little camera. And, uh, and we can have a big old knife hang right here. One of my favorite parts of the week. So for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.